So obviously, if stress interferes with these normal functions in our system, then eliciting the relaxation response will restore normal functioning. Reversal of the stress response leads to homeostasis within the system. The system can get back, as I said, to normal function, which is in includes improved immune function and the healing response, also leading to improved mood and other quality of life factors. So there's several indices of mindfulness and other practices that elicit the relaxation response. Obviously, mindfulness is not the only thing that we can do to relax. Um, as I point out to high school kids in high school, there's a, when I do a lot of speaking at the students, they are overwhelmingly stressed these days, high school kids are. And there's a lot that they can do to begin to relax. Mindfulness is a very effective technique. Now studies are starting to come out comparing mindfulness meditation practices with things like guided relaxation and other modes of relaxation. Um, mindfulness seems to get right to the heart of it and be one of the most effective ways of eliciting the relaxation response. We can measure the outcomes of research on mindfulness in terms of the clinical outcomes. Do people get better? Do they feel better? Are there less indices of disease? We can also measure the indices of mindfulness in terms of specific brain effects, and these would be the mechanisms of action. What are the biochemical, structural, energetic effects? And I mentioned epigenetic. As Dr. Kaplan mentioned, I um, have finished a research project I was doing at the VA hospital looking at the effects of mindfulness interventions with soldiers. Um, the requirements for partic participation in this study were that the veterans had chronic pain in excess of six months, and many of them had chronic pain in excess of five years. So five years they'd been being treated for pain at the VA hospital. They were still suffering from chronic pain. They were considered chronic pain patients. Um, in our study, we also required that they, we were working with people who also had PTSD and traumatic brain injury. In this study, all indices of pain decreased significantly within eight weeks of a mindfulness practice and remained below baseline at a 12-week follow-up. And here's some of the data right out of the study. This is baseline measures of um, stress, sleep, mood, and so forth. And it showed that all of these measures improved and stayed significantly better at a 12-week follow-up. So after eight weeks of practice of a meditation intervention, and I, I, let me point something out that I have noticed over and over again, and I think we need a big review of the literature. One of the most sensitive endpoints to practicing these mindfulness um, techniques is sleep, quality of sleep, all the mind-body practices. We hosted a program, the Mindfulness Center hosted a program called Mind Body Week, and we have a number of researchers come and present and other masters in the field. And over and over again, I noticed that one of the outcomes, just like in this data point, there's a whole lot of bits of data here, but over and over again, I see that sleep is one of the most sensitive endpoints. And remember what's going on when we sleep. Sleep is when the body heals, right? During slow wave sleep, the physical body is restored, growth hormone is released. During REM sleep, the brain is restored. Uh, so improving quality of sleep is a huge and important endpoint. Let me mention a little bit of something about this research at the VA. You know, there's a lot of mind-body practitioners now infiltrating what, what we might have considered the bastion of um, conservative practices, the VA hospital, the Department of Defense. Um, and yet, they let in Reiki practitioners, they let in massage therapists, they let in all kinds of energy workers, meditation and yoga teachers and so forth. And yet, this is done without significant research on the programs that they're providing. So I went into the DCVA and I said, you know, you've got these yoga nidra meditation programs going on in here and you don't know if these programs are helping or if they're even hurting the veterans and you're supporting these programs, they're spending their vouchers to come in and take these programs, and you don't have any data. And when I left that meeting, that program was funded. So I expect we'll be seeing some more research along those lines. 
Um, I did a similar sort of thing at Children's Hospital, only here the main concern at most pediatric hospitals, including the National, um, Children's National Hospital, is um, the trauma that the kids go through when they present, when they come in for treatment. They're scared. Whether it's a needle stick or whether they're being intubated or whether they're getting chemo, whatever it is, when they come into the hospital, they're scared. And the board of directors has outlined this in their, their annual report as a primary area of concern. Um, so what they let us do was an evaluation. They gave us five minutes. OK, you got five minutes from when the kids come in to when they get their procedures to do an intervention. So we're doing a comparative analysis of a series of fast-acting interventions. My um, graduate student who's doing this is a um, art therapist, so that was one of her areas of interest. We've also done a five-minute guided breathing relaxation meditation. The reports coming back are phenomenal. The parents are calling asking for these interventions. They're asking for the, the breathing CD and so forth. We've seen improvements in the pain severity scores, anxiety scores, heart rate, blood oxygen, all of these areas improve. And um, an, an anecdote, one of the little girls didn't even realize that the needle stick had been done. She was so proud of herself afterwards that she had gotten through this without any fuss or muss. So, we have some clinical data that these interventions work for both um, chronic pain and short-term pain. Let's take a look at some of the mechanisms of action that have been reported in the literature as perhaps the basis for how this could be happening. And I would tell you that the, the trend, initial research on meditation and yoga practices initially looked at eight weeks. I tell my graduate students, you're going to run this study, do it for eight weeks. Some looked at 10 or 12, some looked at 6, but initially MBSR and so forth, they were looking at 8-week trials. Nowadays, I'm seeing a trend in the research, what about 4 weeks? What about 2 weeks? What happens after just one intervention, as we did at Children's Hospital? And we are finding these types of effects and that these mechanisms are affected immediately. We see with meditation practices a decrease in cortisol and adrenaline decreased cholesterol. The majority of cholesterol in your system is there not because of the foods that you eat, but because of the stress in your daily life. So obviously reducing that stress with mindfulness practices will lower the cholesterol levels. HbA1c, blood sugar markers, long-term blood sugar markers are affected. Pro-inflammatory cytokines like C-reactive protein, interleukin 1, 2, 10, fibrinogen, and so forth. All of these mechanisms, when Gary was referring to what's going on in the brain in terms of brain inflammation, these are some of the biomarkers for brain inflammation that mindfulness practices decrease. Mindfulness practices also increase serotonin levels, oxytocin, dopamine. Let's take a look at some of these individual ones. Oxytocin. We refer to oxytocin as the love hormone. Why is that? Yes, it's released with nursing. It's released when the baby's born. It facilitates contraction, both uterine contraction that finishes the birthing process, and it facilitates contraction of the breast tissue to facilitate letdown of the milk so that it's available for the baby. It's also involved in contraction with orgasm. Um, and it's an essential hormone in the bonding process, the pair bonding. When oxytocin is released, you will bond with whoever is present. <laughs> <laughs> the magic potion, maternal behavior, and also relief from anxiety, the love hormone. Dopamine levels are affected by mindfulness practices. Now we think of dopamine because this is the neurotransmitter activated by the administration of cocaine and amphetamines and also Ritalin. It's not as powerful as cocaine and amphetamine. <laughs> it's the feel-good hormone. We have this neurotransmitter in our systems because it's a part of the reward system. How do you feel when you've been really successful at something? And just when you're deserving a reward and you feel really good about it, part of that is the dopamine functioning in your brain. <clears throat> the nucleus accumbens and so forth. <clears throat> dopamine also plays a role in 
regulation of the blood vessels. So heart rate variability and so forth is affected by dopamine. Um, it plays a role in the kidneys in terms of uh, sodium excretion and urine output, the pancreas for insulin production, the digestive system, and the immune system. So we used to think of dopamine as just a neurotransmitter in the brain. But we now find that these, these brain chemicals are playing a role throughout our system, throughout our body, even our digestive system and immune system as well. Serotonin. How do we know of serotonin? Why is serotonin so popular these days? Because of the serotonin selective reuptake inhibitors. These are the primary antidepressants that are prescribed nowadays. SSRIs like Prozac, Paxil, Celexa, Effexor, and so forth. Those are all SSRIs. These chemicals, these pharmaceuticals were designed to hopefully selectively increase serotonin levels in our system on the theory that this will enhance our mood. We're now finding that serotonin um, plays a much larger role than just a neurotransmitter in our brain. One of my favorite studies was um, looking at the role of serotonin in cancer and found that serotonin caused cell death of lymphoma cells. Specifically, Burkett's lymphoma is what they were looking at. We call this type of cell death in cancer cells apoptosis. So when cancer cells self-destruct, we call that apoptosis. Serotonin caused apoptosis of these lymphoma cells. So the question then for pharmaceutical companies was, well, can we use our SSRIs to cause this cell death? And lo and behold, what they found was the exact opposite. In the presence of SSRIs, serotonin was not effective in causing apoptosis. To which they immediately reported, this doesn't mean that SSRIs causes cancer. To which I will add, because that research study has not been done yet, nor do I suspect it will be. But the suggestion was obviously there. <clears throat> but we find for all of serotonin's role in the brain, 90% of the serotonin in our bodies is in our digestive system. So we see a huge impact from meditation on the biochemistry of our brains in terms of neurotransmitters, in terms of hormones, and so forth. We can also look at the indices of and the mechanisms of action for mindfulness practices in terms of brain structures that are affected. And I'll go through, here's a list of them, but I'll go through a number of research studies that have been done. In this study by Tang et al., they looked at the effects of meditation on white matter in the anterior cingulate cortex. The, anterior, the ACC regulates, well, self-perception, self-control, self-awareness, <clears throat> and we found that meditation practices increased white matter in the anterior cingulate cortex. I'm going to jump ahead and mention another study that was done on the ICC. It was a functional MRI study in which subjects were found that they could intentionally activate this part of their brain. So you've got subjects hooked up in an MRI machine, an fMRI, so you, they're looking at their brains at the same time as you are in real time. And they're instructed to practice lighting up the ICC, and they're shown where that part of the brain is. And lo and behold, over a short period of time, they can learn to specifically activate that part of the brain, a very small part of the brain about this big. I went over this data when we were doing our research project at the VA hospital, and the physicians there were incredulous. How could this be the case? How could people actually learn to activate a specific part of their brain? Well, do something. Raise your little finger and wiggle your little finger. How is it that you're able to do that? How is it that you heard my words and you could make your body do that? With an intention, you used your brain. This is several feet away from your brain. The ACC is right in there. <laughs> it doesn't seem that complicated that we could learn to do these sorts of things. So activation of the ICC would, and increases in white matter would seem to potentiate the capacity for self-control, 
self-awareness and self-regulation. Indeed, deficits in ACC activation have been associated with chronic pain, also addiction, attention deficit disorder, depression, and so forth. <clears throat> so anything, any practice that might increase function and increase activation of the ACC would seem to tend to reverse these. And this may account for the clinical outcomes that we've seen. Um, also, brain gray matter density increases. I'm going to skim through these in a little short on time here. But a number of studies have looked at the effects of mindfulness practices in specific brain regions and found um, improvements. Now, these are in normal, healthy subjects. I would like to suggest that we start seeing some research, and this is what I've been proposing to the, the VA and others, is that we start looking at research on mindfulness practices in people with brain deficits. We have a huge industry of concern in children who have sports industry, in injuries, um, in veterans with traumatic brain injury, in um, football players with traumatic brain injury. There's a huge area of interest right now. Why aren't we looking? If we know mindfulness can affect this many parts of the brain in normal people, and we see growth in a normal, healthy brain, what could we possibly do in an injured brain? Um, I put this study in here so that you can see that it's not only um, seated, quiet meditation practices, but also studies in yoga are also showing effects in specific brain regions, increasing the function and the clinical outcomes. <clears throat> Here's the study on MRI, intentional control over brain activation. Um, we saw a 64% decrease in pain and a 40% um, decrease in this scale of pain. So significant decreases in pain. Also Tai Chi, not only meditation, but yoga and Tai Chi practices. 